If I were a con artist, I would certainly paint the body first and then add the blood stains after, like depending on where the hands were, where the feet were. It's like, what happens if I paint a blood stain such that my arm needs to be now two meters long? So clearly an artist would first paint the body and then add or at least blood some kind of outline. Or... But yeah, exactly. But that would mean that underneath the blood stain, we could find evidence of the body if it were uh, uh, the body image, but it's not the case. The blood was there first, but they come to the same conclusions that this is human blood. Meet Father Andrew Dalton, a Catholic priest whose unexpected journey from theology professor to Shroud of Turin expert is as fascinating as the relic itself. In this interview, we delve into the mysterious world of the Shroud and explore the burning questions surrounding its authenticity. Discover how Father Dalton's unexpected encounter with the Shroud led him to become a renowned authority in this field and why his perspective is a must hear for anyone intrigued by the intersection of faith, science, and history. All right, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi. Today I'm joined by Father Andrew Dalton, who is an expert on the Shroud of Turin. That's our topic today. So we're talking about the Shroud of Turin. Is it authentic? What are some questions that have come up about this relic and everything related to the shroud. I'm so excited about uh, this interview today. I'm a teacher at a pontifical university in Rome. I teach uh, synoptic gospels, biblical Greek, biblical Hebrew, and on the side, a little shroud study. How, how did you get into, into shroud, shroud studies? studies? Yeah, so actually I was already 10 years in the seminary when I first heard about the shroud. Mm -hmm. I was studying, and I wanna say, was it second year theology? I think that's right when Emanuela Marinelli, who came to speak at our university, and this woman has dedicated over 30 years of her life to study the Shroud. I think she has some 15 books or more on the Shroud. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they told me, you need to come here, Emanuela. She's awesome. And I met her after uh, her presentation, and I said, how is it possible that I've never heard about this? Yeah. And so um, she said, you thought this was good? Wait next week, you need to come back and hear Paolo Di Lazzaro, who's a physicist, who spent years uh, studying the Shroud from the perspective of physics. And so sure enough, I came back the next week and it was just as good or better. And I said, this is this is incredible. This, what else is there? Paolo said, wait till you come back next week. It's Barry Schwartz, the technical photographer who was part of the Shroud of Turin research project of 1978. He'll be speaking, come back. And here comes this Jewish man with a long white ponytail who in the 1970s was part of a specialized team to study the Shroud, and we became fast friends. I just really hit it off with him. Long story short, I stayed on not for three weeks, but for a full year to do, um, the, in, its, in, in its first year in Italian, the postgraduate certificate in Shroud Studies. And it's the, they always say the best way to learn is to teach. So I was going to classes on the one hand, and then going downstairs where our exhibit was to lead pilgrims through our museum and so studying theology, studying the, the physics, the forensic medicine, the chemistry, and it all weaves together so nicely. It was, um, it was just very exciting. So by the time I graduated um, in theology, I was already beginning to speak publicly on mm -hmm. the Shroud and um, even travel internationally to speak in Singapore and Hong Kong and Macau and Shanghai. And, uh, and then in the States as well, of course, and a little bit in Europe. When I first heard about the Shroud too, because it, it, when you were talking about how you were first introduced to it, it made me uh, think about the, when I was introduced to it. And when you're introduced to it at first, it's like there's all of this evidence that there's this authentic, like from the first century, Shroud of Jesus that was like wrapped around him and like had, it had to have been. Like this has to be the, the Shroud of, of Jesus that he, that he was buried in. And then you come across the carbon dating. Right. And the carbon dating is like, ah. Right. Like it would have been so cool if this was authentic. And then now we have this carbon dating. And so it just kind of like demolishes deflates everything. Deflates you. It deflates, exactly. yeah, it deflates exactly. everything. It like, it throws, it, to me, it, it almost like I was talking actually about this with some friends yesterday on the channel. And uh, it, it kind of like is expected to me that hmm. like in it, almost in every area of life, there's always like an escape route. You right. can always like mm. avoid something. Right. Oh gosh, that reminds me of Pascal. There's a Ponce. I, I, I want to say it's like 430 or somewhere in there, but it's fantastic. He says this about Christianity. You would mm -hmm. appreciate this from yeah. your apologetics point of view. But he says there is enough light 
for those who wish to see. Mm -hmm. There's enough obscurity for those of a contrary disposition. Yes. In that it's like God respects your freedom. Exactly. He doesn't rape your will or intellect. He proposes, he woos, he there's enough evidence, there's enough light for those who truly are truth seekers, they can find their way. But if you want that escape route, he's going to respect your freedom. He's going to there's enough obscurity there to uh, let let that happen. And, and I, I feel like yeah. that's what the carbon dating did mm -hmm. with the shroud. Yeah. Is that it, like it provided that escape route? That's part of it. Yeah, that's part of it. And I think that's exactly right. I think another part of it, though, from a more, to put a positive spin on some bad news, is that it put the shroud on the map. It, the controversy mm. yeah. is actually yeah. part of mm. the adventure. It's part of its allure. And then if anybody's willing to spend a little more than five minutes looking at the the shroud, the, the carbon dating of 1988, they realize, oh, this is not nearly as definitive mm -hmm. as I thought. But you're right. The escape route is, is still there. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk about that. But Right. Yeah. Right. But I, I suggest we might spend a little time first in just the scripture, like where the shroud is mentioned. Okay. Just so people have clear, like what we're even talking about sure. and why it's important. Okay. But I just want to um, mention John chapter 20. Of course, you all know this story because it's uh, what we read on Easter Sunday. Um, it's when... Mary Magdalene gets up very early in the morning because she wants to go see the body of Jesus, but um, he, the body isn't there. And so she says, they've taken away my Lord. And she runs to tell um, Peter and John, and they go racing to the tomb. And this, this is what it says. Notice how often it mentions the word burial cloths or linen cloths in other translations. A really bad translation in the NIV is strips. We'll get into that. In, in, the Greek word is Othonia, and it's a plural, and um, it's often, again, translated burial cloth. So let me just pick it up okay. when they get to the tomb at, um, let's say, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths there. There it is. He saw the, but he did not go in. I'm just going to pause for a second because this is often missed. There's a little detail that I love. He, he says he stooped. And we know this about first century tombs in Israel, both in the north and in the south, that they had this stairwell that led mm. down towards the entryway into this cave. And so if you want to get a good angle to see deep inside without actually walking there, you got to get low because the stairwell creates this, this obstacle, right? Mm -hmm. So that is consonant with what we know from the archaeology about certain types of tombs. He stoops, but he doesn't go in, but he sees he sees from a distance. That's the first time we're going to get a, a verb of visualization. But it's particular vocabulary as we see moving in the, the next verse. Check this out. So then Simon Peter came following him and he went into the tomb. He saw, that's the second mention of the, ver of the verb, he saw the linen cloths. That's that same word. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And like, man, that was three verses to talk about dirty laundry. Like, yeah. what in the world is going on here? There are so many details in the gospel that you would love to have related to the passion of Christ, and you don't get them. Like, the gospel writers are painfully discreet. You're like, come on, give me some more. But all of a sudden, when we get to the discovery of the so-called empty tomb, which at the end isn't so empty after all because we just found what's, what contents are inside. Mm -hmm. It's going to go on and on about this dirty laundry. I, I want to shake the, the evangelist by the lapels and be like, why are we talking about this? Who cares? Like, why is this important? And he's going to mention three times in three verses this Athonia, and he gets to his conclusion in the very next verse. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. Of course, this is the climax of, the, of it all. It's like, he saw and believed. What did he see mm -hmm. so that he yeah. believed? Yeah. Right? It's like, what is it about laundry on the ground that necessitates, that requires the conclusion, what, that Jesus is risen from the dead? This is where you have to pay very special attention to the details. There are three verbs to see. I just want to highlight this crescendo. Remember, it's John from a distance. He sees, the Greek word there is blepo. It's not the same word that is attributed uh, to Peter. Peter walks in, now he gets up close and personal, and he changes verbs. And he, he sees, but it's not blepo, it's now theoreo. That's where we get the word theory and theoretical. But then there's a third instance. When John goes in after Peter, 
and he saw and believe, even though in English it's saw, saw, and saw the same exact language, mm -hmm. in Greek it's not blepo, it's not theoreo, it's the verb horao. And so it's like, why is he changing, why is he shifting his vocabulary and now associating it with belief? This, that verse, verse 8, he saw and believed, that's the first distinctively Christian faith attested to in, in the Gospels. At least if you take Paul seriously when he says, if, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead, your faith is in vain. In other mm -hmm. words, this is the absolute fundament that's the foundation for all the rest. If that goes, all the rest goes with it. And so he's saying this is the first baby steps towards belief in that, and it's connected to what? The testimony of a shroud. And so I want to, I want to say, what is its testimony? What is it saying? Why is it that they move from seeing this, the condition of the tomb as it was, because my theory is that it's what they saw because they saw it, when they saw it, in the way that they saw it. And mm -hmm. it seems that what they saw is this cloth lying flat. Add one more element from science to this. On the shroud, according to the American scientists, there, there was a strip, there's a depression in the beard that suggests that to keep the mouth shut, probably, because after rigor mortis relaxes, you know, you just get this gaping jaw that doesn't look so nice. And so perhaps to keep the mouth closed, they have this strip on the outside in such a way that you have also at the, um, just between the knees and the ankles, well, there's a strip as well because the man of the shroud is a little bit taller on the front than he is on the back. That doesn't make any sense, but what's, ha what's happening there is there's a fold, there's a crease um, at the shins, the level mm -hmm. of the shins, mm -hmm. so that um, it looks like he's a little taller. Mm -hmm. But that suggests that if you have, remember, the word was othonia, that's a plural. So we know there's the long sheet. The, the word in Luke's gospel, also in the other synoptics, is uh, a syndon. That's the word for shroud, this big, long sheet. We know that's part of it, but there's also, evidently, something else because it's the word othonia, linen cloths, with an S in John and in Luke. And so it's clear to me that there's both a shroud and something else tying it together, which is very suggestive. If you remember um, John chapter 11, there's Lazarus. He's in the tomb. Mm -hmm. And you remember what Jesus says to him as he calls him out of the tomb? This is a little detail, but he gives a little instruction. He says, untie him, mm. which suggests that there's something to untie, right? And so it may well be the case that uh, Jesus had something similar, something to untie. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is this, because I can't jump in a time machine and reconstruct exactly what he saw, but I do know this. It's what they saw. It's the condition of the tomb as they saw it that led them to believe. And so I think it's a bit unfortunate that it's gone down in history um, with the language of the empty tomb. I, I know what people are trying to say. There's a, the body that was supposed to be inside filling it isn't. And so yeah. with that, to that respect, it is empty. But it's actually quite curious that it's the testimony of that which was there filling that tomb that led them to belief. You know, as Christians, our faith rests upon eyewitness testimony. But I always ask, who was there in the moment that cadaver transferred into new, glorified, divinized, resurrected life. Mary Magdalene gets up early, but not early enough. You know, he's already gone. But the shroud was there. If it wrapped his body, it was a witness to the moment, the instant he came to new life. And I think it's pretty darn cool that we have not only documents, but also a monument. That's the gold standard for history. Documenta et monumenta. So monumentum here, in this case, is the is the shroud itself. It's an archaeological object. Just so happens it's the most studied archaeological object in the history of the world, and it attests to the death and resurrection of Jesus. What would it actually take someone to believe that Jesus was resurrected as opposed right. to just like the body stolen or something like that? Oh, and this is where we have to move forward in the passage just a little bit because it doesn't end in the crescendo, which is an encounter with the shroud. If you keep reading, Mary Magdalene moves through the exact same itinerary from Bleppo all the way to Horao. That is, she's going to encounter the Lord, and then she's going to say, I have seen the Lord. And you'll never guess which verb it is. In other words, there's a crescendo. What I'm trying to suggest is there's natural sight, mm -hmm. but then there's supernatural sight, the vision of faith. And that is superior to, but it doesn't 
abolish or diminish or destroy natural vision. Mm -hmm. It fills it up. And so the the encounter is the end point, the encounter with the living Jesus. We need reason, we, we need faith even more, but we need encounter with the living God who is Jesus resurrected most of all. So that's where I think the itinerary goes. And I think it's a motif throughout John's gospel. He's everywhere using it. Remember Thomas, something very similar. Uh, have you believed, Thomas, because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and believed. There's this idea of supernatural faith is a superior way of seeing, a superior way of encountering the Lord. Don't cling to me, Mary. It's not a bodily contact that you're meant to have, a bodily relationship in this interim phase before Christ comes in, in his glory to return. The way we commune with him is through faith, but that's no less vision. In fact, it's superior. It is all the good of the of the lesser good and then some. There's a philosopher that I uh, am friends with, and he's he said to me on a couple different occasions that like, if you just think hard about what is the best type of evidence you could get, and if you just reflect on like that on that abstractly, he says if God exists, then it would be divine testimony from God would be the best evidence you could ever get on anything. Uh huh. Yeah, because he can't deceive, nor can he be deceived. That's his nature. He is truth. It's uh, it would be a contradiction for him to do otherwise. And so, yeah, usually authority is the weakest argument because if we're talking about creatures, if we're talking about men, we're fallible. God's not, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. And so, and so his, uh, the, his authority is actually the strongest argument. If you look at St. Thomas, by the way, uh, if you, you're familiar with his Summa, he takes up a bunch of objections and then he answers that objection. Mm -hmm. And he's going to say, but I say, and then he's going to quote scripture every single time because he believes that that's the, um, that's the clincher. If God's word says it, that settles the matter. Of course, then he's going to explain and then offer you know the counter arguments to each objection, but he always begins with an argument from authority, divine authority, not yeah. human authority. Of course, Jesus is crucified around 33 AD. Obviously, the shroud is in the tomb at that time, according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. According to a shroud is is in there. So a, a there's, a, there's a question of whether exactly. or not this is the burial. Fair point. enough. That's exactly right. So the next step would be, I think, to look to Abgar. We have a legend of Thaddeus Jude, one of the 12, who goes to Edessa to this king who hears about this healer down south. He says, hey, um, let me see Jesus. I want to be cured of my leprosy. The next best thing, apparently, is that Thaddeus Jude, after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, he goes with this burial shroud bearing the image of the Savior. And when King Abgar venerates this face on, on this burial shroud, he's cured of his leprosy and he converts to Christianity. And so there's a pocket of Christians right there in Edessa. And they flourish for a time, but then his son takes the throne and persecutes the Christians who go into hiding along with, guess what? The shroud. And so it's not rediscovered until they rebuild the city walls after a flood, the flood of 525 that destroys much of the city. They're reconstructing and in 544, they discover this cloth, a cloth that bears the image of the savior. Many believe that even though it doesn't, it's not called the Shroud of Turin at this point because it's not yeah. yet in Turin, yeah. still they think it to be one and the same document. And so there it is in the 6th century. It's in 944 when Romanus I is in Constantinople and he wants to bring together all of the relics of Christ's passion under one roof and he's like, hey, my house guys, here it comes. And so it goes from Edessa to modern day Istanbul. And there it is until the Fourth Crusade. 1204 is the fourth crusade when European um, um, crusaders, they um, sack basically and appropriate uh, the, the shroud mm -hmm. and go back to Europe with it. This is what's called the famous missing years between 1204 and 1354. Where exactly did it pass? Whose hands did it go through? What we do know is this. In 1354, it's on display in the hands of a certain Geoffroy de Charny, a French nobleman with ties to the Knights Templar. This is one theory. I'll float it out there. There are many theories, but some people have suggested that, okay, you have these European uh, crusaders that weren't too keen on saying, hey, look what I have. I just stole it from 
the cathedral there in Constantinople. And so once t- enough time had passed um, and they were after venerating it privately, now they can put it on public display. The bottom line is, is that in 1354, we have very sure documentation about the shroud and its whereabouts from that point onward. So the paper trail is very clear after this point. Uh, I think it goes from uh, France. It's in uh, Chambéry. Um, it's in Lire. It's a big moment. Is a fire? There's a fire in 1453. I want to mm-hmm. say. Hope I get that year right. Um, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I'm, I'll have to think about that. In, in any case, the it gets. I know to Turin in 1571. I think that's the year. Maybe 1578. But it's Charles Borromeo, who is a cardinal in the northern regions of uh, Italy. And he wants to visit in France, just across the mountains. Um, but they say, no, no, you're, you're older. No need to cross those mountains. We'll bring the shroud to you. Just, uh, just bring it back. Well, that was in the 16th century, and it's not come back since. So I think it's made its home there in Turin. Um, in, in, what is it, 1983, that it is bequeathed from the royal family, the Savoy family, to the person of Pope St. John Paul II as the one who occupies the chair of Peter, mm-hmm. right? So it's the possession of the current Pope. So Francis owns the shroud. Of course, he has his archbishop there in uh, in Turin and with his delegate, but that it's the property now in only very recent times of, uh, of the Pope, but um, it's been this frail cloth, which I think is so funny is that, you know, all these castles have crumbled <laughs> de Char- I told you about Geoffroy de Charny, this French nobleman. Mm-hmm. He passed down the shroud to his own descendants until they ran out of kids. And then I think it's Margaret de Charny who has no descendants. And so she sells it for a couple castles. It's like, yeah, here's the burial shroud of Jesus. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a funny story. But many of these places have uh, crumbled, the, made of stone. And yet this little linen is still with us. I think that's fascinating. It's like, why didn't it get destroyed along the way? I mean, if it is all these many uh, centuries old, at least. And then obviously the question is, is the same shroud that is spoken about from the time of Jesus, the same shroud that we have now in Turin? Exactly. And so there are different ways of determining that. I mean, Mm -hmm. certainly carbon dating is going to enter in, but actually there are some really important historical ways too. Like for example, the Hungarian Prey Codex or the Sudarium. I should mention these two. All right, so take a look at that. That's the Hungarian Prey Codex. And if you'll notice that there's two scenes, it's like a comic strip from Mm -hmm. the 12th century. Mm -hmm. uh, And we can date it very precisely because there's musical notation in this Prey Codex. And uh, it's dated to 1192 to 1195. So look closely at the upper scene. See how there's men with beards coming to anoint a body? Mm -hmm. There's one guy that's beardless. I guess that's John, perhaps the younger disciple. But the body is, has uh, some special features. You see the halo that has a cross in it? Mm -hmm. That's clearly Jesus who is being wrapped in a linen cloth. Mm -hmm. If you look at his hands, one feature is very strange. Most of us have five fingers, but this guy has four, no thumbs. Mm -hmm. Just so happens that on the shroud, you can't see the thumbs. We could get into this, but um, it seems they're folded in such a way that the thumbs are underneath the index finger Mm. so that from above, you you just don't see them. Some have postulated that when the uh, ulnar nerve is severed or grated against because the nail that pierces through is called destat space right here in your wrist, one a kind of knee-jerk reaction to that is that the, the um, thumbs fold in. It's a debated point. The bottom line is you don't see the thumbs on the shroud, but you don't see them either on this Hungarian prey codex, suggesting that the cloth that's underneath that body is the shroud. It gets even better, though, because if you go to the scene just below, now it's these women that are coming to anoint a body that isn't there. And Mm -hmm. so the angel is like signaling to say, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He's not here. He's been raised. And so they're unable to anoint. But now what do we see? Because the body's not there, more closely the cloth. Mm -hmm. And you can see two features, the weave. Can you see the diagonal lines that Mm -hmm. almost looks like a pyramid or something? Mm -hmm. But that is exactly corresponding. To what's called the herringbone weave, that you on the on the on the loom, what you do is you go over three threads and then under one and then over three and under one, and you repeat this pattern such that at the end of the day you get these kind of like diagonal lines that look like the spinal cord of a fish. So somebody called it a herringbone weave. 
On the shroud, it's a three to one herringbone weave with a Z twist. Just so happens that it matches that very nicely, that the picture that's there. But the best part is these holes, the so-called poker holes. Can you see those four um, circles in the shape of like a seven or an L just on the um, opposite side? This top one? Yeah, so that's a zoomed in version. But if you mm -hmm. look on the, um, on the Hungarian Precodex itself, you can zoom in on it and you'll see that you'll see uh, in the shape of a seven or in the shape of an L, those four circles appear again. So in the exact same position and orientation as we find on the shroud, we find here on the Hungarian Prey Codex. Even though the cloth is two-dimensional, it actually encodes 3D information. In other words, we can build, and you've seen if you've come to our yeah. museum, a 3D statue of the body. That's not just like artistic, I don't know, imagination. We can actually derive out of a two-dimensional cloth the three three dimensional contours of the body. In other words, we know its position, we know its size. Um, sure, there, there can be a little discussion about the eyebrows and, and details like that, but the, the basic contours of the body, we know. Um, and I think that is just fascinating. And, and not just that, I mean, the highest powered um, laboratories in America, when they catch wind of this discovery, when they visualize what is first visualized by the VP8 in 1978, or a year prior, I suppose, um, this is going to mobilize them to work together to then petition the royal family in Italy and they say, give us five days. Let us work 120 hours around the clock. We'll come overseas with 80 crates of the most state-of-the-art equipment so that we can answer one question. It's not a religious question. It's simply a scientific one. By what means, by what mechanism was this image impressed upon that cloth? That's what they wanted to answer in a definitive way. It's really frustrating for them because they have they come home with more questions than they get answers because they actually disprove every single naturalistic theory that was on the table. They had already made a, a list of every pigment known to man. You know, it's like, is it magnesium nitrate? Okay, well, let's test for it this way or that. Mm -hmm. Paralysis mass spectroscopy is one of the tests that they do. Physics, chemistry, um, X-ray, infrared, ultraviolet, um, paralysis mass spectroscopy, I mentioned spectroscopy, um, sticky tape samples, blood, blood samples, you name it, they're going to test it. They just want to answer, is it a painting? Is it a scorch? Is it is it a rubbing? Is it a camera oscura? Those are four theories that were on the table. Hmm. But with scientific tests, they actually disprove every single one so that their conclusion is that the shroud is not artwork, that it's not been washed away by water, though exposed and soaked in water. Something burnt away by fire. A fire didn't burn burn it away. Water didn't wash it away. Is producing the shroud such that the image, to get to your point now, lies on the very surface of mm -hmm. the, the the fibers. We don't have a micro laser today that is capable of delivering a micro burn as subtle as superficial as we find on the shroud. This is um, mind boggling. I'll give you a figure. I'm not sure it's going to mean much to you. The depth of penetration of coloration on the shroud is 200 to 500 nanometers. That's one-fifth of one-thousandth of a millimeter. Uh, and again, these are numbers that are, that are impossible to... <sighs> let me make it more graphic. If you take a single hair and, and, you, and you cut it in half and discard the half, with the half that remains, do that again and cut it in half. Do that four or five times. Let's be at one-sixteenth or one-twentieth the width of a human hair. And that's that's what we're talking about with the depth on of the penetration. Top of the, yeah, right. So if you just coloration. Exactly. If you were to take like a razor blade and just like gently graze over the surface of the of the shroud, you would erase forever the the, the picture of the man. So it's not like blood that is soaked into the fibers. Right. Which you, there are indications of blood. Absolutely. And they're that very are soaked, different. That are soaked through. Yeah, and get this. Um underneath the blood stain, there is no body image. So walk with me here for a second. Uh, let me give you an analogy. I think it'll be clear in a moment. So if you've ever been um, like to the beach by yourself and you don't want to like ask someone to put sunscreen on and so you try to do it yourself and there's that spot in the middle of your back that mm -hmm. you just can't reach and mm -hmm. so you're like, okay, pasty everything. white everywhere else except for that one little red spot right in the, right in the middle. Okay, my, my suggestion is that the blood on the shroud is like sunblock but where there isn't blood there's room for exposure. There's mm. room for the light effects to leave their trace. 
because if I were a con artist, I would certainly paint the body first and then add the blood stains after, like depending on where the hands were, where the feet were. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine doing it the other way around? Like, let's do the blood stains and then we'll paint the body. It's like, what happens if I paint a blood stain such that my arm needs to be now two meters long, right? Yeah. That wouldn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So clearly an artist would first paint the body and then add Or at least blood do some stains. kind of outline. Or... But yeah, exactly. But that would mean that underneath the blood stain, we could find evidence of the body if it were uh, uh, the body image. But it's not the case. The blood was there first and it's now protecting the mm. threads below mm. such that in a second moment, when the body image is impressed upon the cloth, it's only on those threads which are not covered by blood stains. Is mm -hmm. that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's a really good argument for uh, against the forgery thesis, which just doesn't hold. You know, it's just, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, these blood stains are the kind, it's the kind of blood that we can put into a laboratory. We can learn all kinds of details about it. So uh, in the United States, it was Hel uh, what is it? At Helen and Adler, I want to say. And then um, Baima Bologna is the forensic doctor there in Italy. But they come to the same conclusions that this is human blood and um, many different traits. But I want to zoom in on one in particular. It's the, the blood stain. Do you know the type? Some have gone so far as to say that it's blood type AB. However, in the more modern era, some have called that into question. I'm thinking of my teacher is Dr. Kellen Kirst is an immunologist. Uh, mm. Where is he? In Tennessee or Kentucky or something. But um, he says, look, we need to do further, further tests on that to get that level of detail. But some have gone so far as to say that it is AB, which is interesting because the pseudodium has been said to be AB and these Eucharistic miracles throughout the world have said to, uh, are, are, are tested to be AB. The face cloth that you were talking about earlier, right. has the blood there been, analyzed. been yeah. analyzed compared to yes. the... Yes, and so one of, one of the characteristics, for example, I know is the proportions of water to blood, and it's indicative of lung edema, especially so someone who's been beaten or scourged would have suffered something just like this. And so there's evidence of uh, the similar traits in the blood. Um, we don't have the genome, so it's not like that. It's too degenerated now mm -hmm. to, to like reconstruct all of the properties that we would like to have. But there are certain like enzymes, and I'm no immunologist, so I'll defer to people like uh, Kelly Kurse and others, but you can find abundant literature on this. In fact, this is the problem with Shroud studies, is that each little question is a universe unto itself, mm -hmm. so that nobody can truly be an expert. I know people sometimes refer to me as that. I, I, I reject that uh, that title. I'm not an expert. <laughs> Sorry, I think I said that at the beginning. <laughs> no, it's okay. But um, I mean, we all are trying to dabble into our area of expertise, but also be aware of the other, because it's really, it's the cumulative force of all these elements together that really brings home a strong argument, right? It's not just one detail. I mean, I could point to one detail, if you like, that I think is already convincing on its own. But to me, it, that wouldn't be the full force of the argument. It would just be one angle of it. Mm -hmm. If I had to pick one, I'd probably pick the crown of thorns. Because if you were to make a list of all the people who were crowned and crucified in the ancient world or just in history, there's exactly one person on that list. And that's Jesus of Nazareth. If others were crowned and crucified, we didn't write about it. And so... My question is, who is that guy on the shroud, if mm -hmm. not Jesus? And it's not just those two combinations, but we have wounds in the hands and in the feet and wounds in the side, mm -hmm. plus the scourge marks, plus the evidence of carrying the, the patibulum and then crucified in a horizontal position. We could go on and on like this. And it corresponds to everything we know from the Gospels. The fact that they, they struck his face. These little, it's the minutia. Check this out. There's residual soil on the feet, no surprise there, on the knee, and on the nose. You, hmm. can, you can analyze the, that soil. Obviously, it's suggestive that he fell first to his knee and then all the way flat to his face, which is horrible to think about when you think of... Is, is it true that the soil has been traced to Jerusalem? Yes, so this is what I was going to say. So in um, the, the soil, if you look at it um, under a microscope, if you analyze it chemically, what what's been determined is that it is calcium carbonate with a touch of strontium apparently and its crystalline structure is travertine aragonite according to one geologist she says it matches the grotto the soil of the grottos of jerusalem like a fingerprint mm -hmm. and so on the theory that this was fabricated in france in the middle ages what then is it doing with palestinian soil 
on the feet, knee, and nose, precisely where you'd imagine contact with the ground, because each of those stick out, right? This, mm-hmm. You would land on your knee, you would land on your nose, and there you get this particular, very rare um, aragonite structure, and yet there, there it is, nevertheless. When you do carbon dating, it's, you don't get a window, a large arc. Um, that was how it was published at the end of the day. These three laboratories, Arizona, Zurich, and Oxford, they come together. They don't give their individual findings. They lump them and average them together and say, it's certainly from 1260 to 1390. That's a 130 year span of time. What actually happened is that Arizona one got a date of something like 1240, if I'm not mistaken. But get this, Arizona two, which is just a couple of centimeters to the right, is something like 1440, if I'm not mistaken. And it's something, like it's a gap of about 200 years in something like two centimeters. They didn't tell you this in 1988. Mm-hmm. They didn't tell you that there was a gradation that as you move left to right, it goes from older to younger within the space of a few centimeters. Remember, the shroud is 4.4 meters long. What is that? It's like uh, 13 foot seven, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you do? What do you get? What kind of date do you get when you move all the way to the right. Is that a date in the future? <laughs> These are things that were not in the original publication, as you can yeah. imagine. And so it just, it was enough to put on a front page news, hey, this is medieval, we've averaged our things together, um, and this is what we get. Mm-hmm. It's very likely, to my mind, it's likely that what they sampled was a mixture of first century material and 16th century material. But depending on how much first century material you had in your particular splice, in your particular sample, mm-hmm that's gonna render a different average, right? Because we're averaging 16th century material and first century material on this theory of French invisible weave. Mm-hmm. The bottom line is if you accept that theory or you wanna to point to another, it's still the same, that the, the sample is not worthy of our consideration because it's anomalous, it's not representative of the rest of the shroud. I, we, one more thing to really nail the, put a nail in the coffin of this uh, shroud, uh, this carbon dating argument. They're the only, as of 2017, I think it is, that a French researcher by the name of Tristan Casabianca, um, he uses the Freedom of Information Act to compel these uh, laboratories to now publish their, not only their conclusions, but the raw data that led them to their conclusions, Mm -hmm. which they did not reveal. But now, 30 years later or whatever it is, they're forced to. And he, he exposes, and now this is a matter of mainstream science, so much so that the very uh, magazine or publication out of Oxford, I think it's called Archaeometry, um, the one that published that we have 95% certainty that it's medieval, um, now has recanted, now reneged and said, no, we cannot conclude that which we originally published. And so, like I say, even, even, even those who would debunk the shroud can't point to this particular data point in order to justify that position. They might be right, they might be wrong, but that definitely is not a valid argument to reach that conclusion. Any longer. Any longer, exactly. So maybe before the publication of 2017, you could get away with um, a certain, uh, you know, yeah, but it's kind of interesting. Now, throw it out. Throw it. It's just, See, it's not... So in order to test the actual date, would we need to take a sample from something that's like closer to the center? Yeah. And you would, that was the original but then, protocol. But then if you do that, you really like destroy it. destroy the the whole thing. So I, I mean, I, I get why they wanted to take a, sure. a sample from one of the corners. But then at the Absolutely. same time, it's like, how do you actually test this thing? If you have that's to right. destroy that sample, you have to clip it out or... right. Yeah, well, so nowadays, it's kind of difficult to... absolutely, and keep in mind, that was in 1988, and perhaps the technology in, in future time will be even more sophisticated, such that mm. we don't have to destroy as much, um, but you can be selective and pick certain threads here and there. The original protocol, if I'm not mistaken, called for seven different samples in seven different laboratories. This somehow gets whittled down into three, and then just one sample, and like I say, in the corner, in the corner, it's, 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 it's a fiasco. There's a whole documentary just on, in Italian, and it was called La Notte della Sindone. Oh, no. Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think it's The Night of the Shroud. Um, and it, it, it just uh, tells the story of the carbon dating, casting down. Now, that was early on. Now we've got much, much more information than we did back then. 
Um, so, uh, like I say, it's um, it's just not important. I hate to spend so much time on something that, at the end of the day, means nothing to to for dating this route. Like, um, even if they did good science, like even if Arizona and Oxford and Zurich, even if they did the best of science, um, and 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 as many would call into question certain elements of it. But I wouldn't. I, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they did good science. It's just not relevant. It's just not relevant for the the dating of the rest of the shroud. And like I say, we already knew that from the Hungarian Prey Codex and the Sudarium and so many icons that it's not even possible that it come from the 1200, the 1260 or um, 1390. Um, so that it's just it's not it's not good science, and we can do better than that. Look, I'm glad it's there. This is uh, this is perhaps uh, the great paradox of this whole thing. The the shroud and is known by many only for this reason. Oh, it's a medieval fake. The carbon yeah, dating. Yeah. And I want to say, great people know about the shroud. Like its name, it's on the map. Now, anyone who is a truth seeker, anyone who has got that pensée rattling in my, you know, there's enough light for those who wish to see. There's enough obscurity for those of a contrary disposition. Yeah, this has been this has been so much fun though. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for the invitation. I loved it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in today. <laughs> I've been Cameron Bertuzzi, Father Andrew Dalton, capturing Christianity. Uh, don't forget to do all the things: subscribe, like, uh, do the bell thing that actually does help you get notified when we post new videos and content. But uh, thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next capturing Christianity video.